Greg Biggs, this evening's speaker, will be talking today on the logistics of William Tecumseh Sherman's Atlanta campaign, as you can see from the screen. This is Greg's, he believes, third visit to this round table. He has uh, been a student of military history for 55 years, not just the Civil War, World War II, Napoleon, other interesting eras. Uh, he uh, is very familiar with the Civil War Roundtables. He's the president of the Clarksville, Tennessee Roundtable, program chair of Nashville Roundtable. He mentioned it on our table earlier, and it's in the write-up, that he met his wife at a round table in Long Beach. Uh, he was living in California at the time. <laughs> he's, had, he's got books for sale, but he didn't write them. But they look like they're pretty good titles over there. But he has written several articles, and he will talk to us, as we said before, about the logistics of Sherman's Atlanta campaign. Great. everybody. Uh, I recognize some faces. I, I, I'm terrible at names. I even, every now and then look at my wife and go, where are you again? Um, for birthday in two days, so i got to find something really cool on, on the road. Um, from the tours I've done for the Kenosha Civil War Museum, I've been privileged to speak there a couple times. This is, my, I believe, my third time here. Uh, and I'm very honored and flattered to be here. I am 50% cheesehead. My mother is from Milwaukee, and uh, I have second cousins running around here someplace that I haven't seen in a million years. But, uh, so I'm always flattered to come to my mom's hometown. Uh, also, uh, those of you who do uh, Wisconsin research, uh, I'm in need of, of things of the 13th Wisconsin Infantry in August to September of 1862 because they were guests in my town of Clarksville, Tennessee, and fought at the only land battle in our county, the Battle of Riggins Hill. I know they were from the Janesville area. Uh, there's a gentleman I've met online through the Rockford Roundtable that's working on a book on the 13th, and I've shared a bunch of stuff with him. Uh, went out to Riggins Hill Battlefield, took pictures of where the 13th Wisconsin fought for him. Right next to Allen's gun shop, who would know? <laughs> they get stuck, they ran out of bullets, they just ran into Allen's and bought some more. Um, not the right caliber, and they had things like Russian sniper rifles for sale and stuff like that. Um, but also, my neighbors, four miles from my front door, who I'm greatly privileged to do staff rights for uh, on an occasional basis, are the 101st Airborne Division. Um, the Screaming Eagles. And if you go, and you can get on post, and the post museum is, the Pratt Museum is fantastic. It's been recently redone. It's, all you gotta do is have a driver's license and, and proof of insurance and where you wanna go, and you can go pretty much anywhere you want on post. Uh, but if you do that, stop at division headquarters and go inside, and you will see the color guard of the 8th Wisconsin with Old A, the War Eagle on a pedestal. Because there is a lineal connection between the 101st Airborne and, and the 8th Wisconsin via the Wisconsin National Guard, if I have my history correct. Uh, so that's where the Eagle logo of the 101st Airborne Division comes from. So uh, those of you who are badgers, you might want to come on down and, and uh, stop in at the Pratt and also run into division headquarters and see, uh, see the color guards. I did a staff ride, I had a meeting in there with one of the battalion colonels, and I, I told the lady I was working with the captain, I said, I'm a real big, excuse me, flag nerd. Um, we have a mutual former or late friend, Howard Mattis was my protege, or my, I should say, I'm the protege, he was the mentor, I, or I'm the padding one, he was the Jedi master um, of Civil War flags, and, and uh, we miss him a lot. Those of you who knew how he knew what kind of an interesting character he was, a great cook. I don't know if he knew that or not, that guy could cook. Holy cow, could he cook. Um, so you know, I, I have a lot of ties to Milwaukee and Wisconsin, so thank you again for having me up. Now, I am from uh, down the road in, in Illinois, I'm a Chicago suburb native, and I grew up in Georgia, and I used to work on the Peachtree Creek Battlefield. So when you are in Atlanta in the 70s before five million other people showed up to be in Atlanta, um, you can see a lot more of the Civil War than you can see now, although I know where to go. I do tours of the Atlanta campaign and stuff. So I've also got corporate retail experience, and so I'm interested in logistics because I had to deal with logistics. 
I worked for a retail chain. I was in the buying office, so I'm buying. I had to make sure shipments came in from the record labels to our warehouse, from the warehouse out to the stores. Nothing is different in the Army. And the last three staff rides I've done for the 101st of all been for logistics units. So they, they get off the fact that a civilian is a big logistics wonk. And I am, I, I've got tons of books on Civil War logistics. So this to me is the pinnacle of Civil War logistics. It does not get any better than Sherman's preparations for the Atlanta campaign. And I'll go into a lot of uh, detail on this. Let's go back over 2,000 years to Swan Sioux. Great book if you haven't read his Art of War. Fantastic book, as a matter of fact. Uh, without its equipment, the Army is lost. Without base stores, the Army is lost. If he figured that out over 2,000 years ago, anybody that's been a professional officer in the United States military, whatever branch of service, understands logistics. He was speaking truth to power, if you will, back in those days, and he figured it out. Napoleon, in two of his maxims, talks about one line of operation. That's where Jomini gets it wrong, uh, that teaches all the Civil War generals. Don't put your army in cantonments when you have a means of collecting supplies and forage. Napoleon's army can outmarch his contemporaries because he wasn't hauling food with him. He's hauling ammunition, medical supplies, and shoes. I will put Napoleon's army up against Jackson's foot cavalry any day of the week in terms of marching ability. How did they feed themselves? They lived off the land. So they didn't have to haul food like the other European armies did. And then Gus Pagodas is the CENTCOM uh, logistics officer. Good logistics is combat power. And boy, do they teach that in the military today. Dennis Kelly, the former historian of the uh, Kennesaw Mountain a long time ago, once told me that if the Confederates had learned what Sherman's preparations were for the Atlanta campaign, they would have just given up. Because there was no way they were going to beat this guy in terms of his logistical preparations. He just buried the Confederates in supplies. So let's look briefly at the Union Depot system, and in this we will come up with another name yet for the American Civil War. Of course, I live in the South now, so it's the War of Northern Aggression, uh, the War of Yankee Imperialism, let me think of some other ones, uh, of course, the War Between the States. The regions that you see, is this got a laser pointer on us? I don't blind. Yeah, there we go. So we have three regions. There's your Eastern Depots, the two big ones, New York and Philadelphia. The Cincinnati Depot and Louisville Depots for the Western Theater, and then the St. Louis Depot for the Trans Mississippi. Guess what? Confederates did the exact same thing. So you have depots in Richmond, depot in Charleston, the Atlanta Depot, Mobile Depot, and then you had Houston and Shreveport for the Trans Mississippi. Let's call it the war between the regions, because each of the depots supplied the bulk of the troops within their geographic military uh, zone, if you will. Now there's going to be some cross pollination. Again, as a flag historian, I went through quartermaster records at the National Archives some years ago, and I was particularly concentrating on the Cincinnati Depot, and I was actually stunned to find flags coming from the New York and Philadelphia Depot to the Cincinnati Depot, even though they had two local flag makers cranking up flags. The bottom line is that I learned from this, if you can't fill the order here, we will fill the order there and ship it in and then distribute from the depot. So that's how that will shake out. And the Confederates will do a lot of the same kind of thing. Sherman's problems, supplying 115,000 men and a whole bunch of animals for a long campaign, four and a half to five month campaign. The condition of the railroads in the state of Tennessee and the management of those railroads, lack of locomotives and rolling stock. And we'll talk about why. Because the difference of the gauges in the north between those of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. All those were five foot gauge. The width of the track, five feet. Modern gauge is four feet, eight and a half inches. That becomes standard well after the Civil War when they finally decide to do that. Now, a lot of people use the four different gauges for the Confederacy as a knock to the Confederate transportation system. The Union had six. They had two more gauges than the Confederates did. It had to do with the vision of building a railroad. The Erie and Lackawanna Company says, I only want to haul the freight on our line. We'll build our tracks at six foot gauge. I don't care if the Buffalo and Bozo Railroad builds them at five, gauge, five foot gauge. They try to connect with us. It's not going to happen. It's that petty. It really is. And the same thing goes on to a lesser extent in the South. That's why you get all these different gauges. And that's why after the war, they all sat down and said, you know, if we really want to have a transcontinental railroad system where things from the East can go to the West and vice versa, all the gauges better well be the same. So thank God somebody had some sense to do that. Water transportation and problems with the Cumberland River, which flows through where I live in Clarksville, Tennessee. 
The Eastern Theater has navigable rivers only up to places like Washington City, Richmond, Virginia, a couple places in North Carolina, whereas the rivers in the West, the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Cumberland, the Tennessee, are deep into the South navigable. At least to the Muscle Shoals on the Tennessee River, and then they have smaller steamboats that went as far up the river as Knoxville, but they had to be significantly smaller because of the shoals there in Tuscumbia, uh, Florence, uh, Alabama. So that, that's going to be a major help and hindrance for the Confederates and for Sherman. Confederate cavalry and guerrilla raids on some plank choke points. You see the newspaper article says General Wheeler on the Grand Round. One of those places was between where I live and Nashville, a place called uh, Harpeth Shoals near Ashland City, where you had the shoals literally sticking out of the water. There was no Tennessee Valley lock and dam system like there is today. Those shoals are now way down underneath the water, so nice barges can go zooming over those, those shoals, unless we have an amazingly bad drought, in which case, no, they're not. So a steamboat coming into Clarksville on its way to Nashville is going to stop off, run to the newspaper office, pick up the newspaper, and check the shoals report. On page four of the Nashville newspapers and the two Clarksville papers was the shoals report. And they would tell you that there was eight feet of water over the shoals or 10 feet of water over the shoals. So if you've got a six foot draft Ohio Riverside, Mississippi Riverside steamboat, you can go eight feet or up over the shoals and safely cross over them. If you've got less than that, you sit in Clarksville or Nashville until the red next thunderstorm showed up and raised the water level. As I tell people in the Fort Donaldson campaign, it rained so much, the rivers rose two feet an hour. Lots of water running down the limestone hills of Middle Tennessee, and water receives its own level, Science 101, and fills up those rivers really quick. Still do today, even with the lock and dams that we had a ton of flooding a lot three months ago. So that's something that you have to look at, is, is transportation choke points. And the Confederates knew where these were, so Wheeler shows up and will attack transports there and damage a bunch of them and force go out to Palmyra. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. So that's something Sherman has to deal with. Crossing the rivers with, a, with bridging, what do you need? Pontoon bridges, because you know the Confederates aren't going to leave the road railroad bridges standing. They're going to take them down. And then defending that long line of supply all the way back to Louisville, Kentucky, you have to have, at the bridge crossing, typically blockhouses. Now, they were great against cavalry raiders, unless the cavalry raiders happened to have artillery, and then those became sitting ducks. Because they're just big, thick pine logs, and they're not going to stop a 12 pound shot coming through at all. Use, that's when you see them surrendering uh, all over the place. So, where does Sherman have to be supplied? One railroad from Atlanta all the way back up to Chattanooga, about 110, 115 miles the Western and Atlantic Railroad today and then owned by the state of Georgia. Georgia also owns the Georgia Railroad out to Augusta, that's how Long Street got to Chickamauga, coming into Atlanta and then rolling up the WNA. Uh, they lease it to CSX Transportation, but the state of Georgia still owns the railroad. So he's got one iron ribbon to get all the way down to Atlanta from his starting point outside of Chattanooga. Tying into the to Chattanooga will be rivers and other railroads. But from this point on, river transportation ceases to be an issue because you can't get up the Chattahoochee River with a boat north of Columbus, Georgia. That's the head of navigation for the Chattahoochee River, which is too small. The Etowah River is too small. They would have some small steamboats on um, the Coosa of the Houston Alder River. Very, very small steamboats would go up that couldn't carry a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me, a whole lot. So they're not going to be a factor. They're mainly going to benefit the Confederates hauling reinforcements in from Alabama. So Union supply history prior to Sherman taking over the military division of the Mississippi. William Star Rosecrans, Don Carlos Buell, and some guy named Grant. These guys all had problems. And as any command that moves into hostile territory, we can talk Alexander the Great, we can talk Napoleon, we can talk uh, the, the Fuhrer going into Russia, we can, who obviously didn't read about what happened in Napoleon. Uh, that anytime you're moving into enemy territory, you have logistical problems. The further away from your base of supply, the longer your line of supply, which means the more troops you have to detach to protect that line of supply. And you can leapfrog supplies forward to cut down transportation time, which good commanders are going to do. And what Sherman is going to learn from is the history of these three gentlemen here. And it's, it's pretty amazing. And one of the, the things that Rosecrans will do that I talk about in my Tullahoma campaign program is to defeat the Confederate cavalrymen, you start going to war with the War Department, I need more cavalry. 
And that will build up the cavalry arm of the Western Union armies to a great extent and, and help negate some of these Union or these Confederate cavalry raiders. And here's what they will fear, as what my friend Myers Brown of our state archives calls the Holy Trinity of Confederate cavalry. You have the little bitty guy, Joe Wheeler, the big guy, Bedford Forrest, in the middle, John Hunt Morton with his lovely wife, Maddie Reedy, not long after they got married. I keep wanting to find where she buys that little hat thing because I want to wear one. I just think it would be kind of neat to do a talk of looking like Matty Reedy as much as possible. If you come to downtown Murfreesboro, where the Antebellum Courthouse still is, one of six that are still used by the state uh, governments and county governments in Tennessee, literally right across the street is where Maddie married uh, John Hunt Morgan in the wedding of the century. I mean, Jeff Davis was there, Bishop Polk was there, Brack was there, a who's who uh, was at that wedding. And of course, he gets killed in Greenville. Tennessee a little bit later on. But these are the guys that are ripping up Buell Supply Line and Grant Supply Line along with Earl Van Dorn and some other people, Tom Woodard, and these are what these people are fearing and what they're having to deal with. Supply lines have been targeted since August of, or not August, February of 1862. My town falls on the 16th, three before Dawson falls on the 16th, we fall on the 19th, Nashville falls on February 25th. So it's bing, bing, bing. And then they have to garrison the town. Here's Clarksville right here. We get taken back by the Confederates in August of 1862. And they'll hold the town for about two and a half weeks. And then here comes a brigade over from Fort Henry, including the 13th Wisconsin. They'll fight at Regan's Hill and recapture the town. This is Palmyra, Tennessee. That's the view looking towards Dover on the Cumberland River. That's where Forrest will climb up on the hill. The trench works are still there. The artillery works are still there. I know the property owner, and that's where Forrest is going to sit while Wheeler is over at Harpeth Shoals. Now, Rosecrans finds out about it and stops all steamboats at Dover, so Forrest will sit there for a couple days and nothing happens. Wheeler will swing over, pick him up, and they will go attack Dover in February of 63, the third battle of Dover. Here is the South Tunnel at Gallatin. When I've done Atlanta campaign tours over at Tunnel Hill, and we look at the tunnel through Cheek to Gita Ridge, that's Cherokee for Tunnel Through the Hill. Um, no, it's not. I have no idea what that is. That's just, the name, that's just the name of the ridge. Cheek to Gita Ridge, say that three times fast. And the first question you get is why didn't they drop the tunnel? And at the Cowan Tunnel, at the end of the Tullahoma campaign, 2,282 feet long, built before they dropped the first rail in the National Chattanooga. Why didn't they drop the tunnel? Okay, how do you drop a tunnel? You have to have boring equipment that will bore about 20 feet into the rock. It's limestone where I live. Everything's limestone where I live. And then you pack it with black powder, and then you run your lines out, and you yell fire in the hole, and then you blow up the tunnel. Now what happens if you beat the Federals south of the tunnel and you're on the offensive coming back the other way? How do you supply your own army? Because you've just blown up a tunnel. You don't. There's no way to do a tunnel. This is the only tunnel in the war that gets dropped because it's bored through coal shale. So it's a very soft rock. And it was actually held up by timber. So when Morgan attacks, um, the, the South Tunnel of Gallatin, he will set fire to some rail cars, shove it in the tunnel, and the tunnel will collapse and be down for 98 days. That's on the Louisville and Nashville River, the prior route back from Nashville to Louisville. So William Lambers, who wrote a fantastic biography on, on Rosecrans about 50 years ago, but it still holds up exceedingly well, you can see what he says during the year ending July 1, trains running the full distance for only seven months and 12 days. That's almost five months when they're not running, bridges being destroyed and rebuilt multiple times, the longest tunnel, South Tunnel, being dropped, rolling station uh, and rail, roll, uh, rolling stock and stations are burned, etc., etc. That's what Rosecrans is having to deal with. And then water levels on the Cumberland River being too low in the summertime. Um, that's what, excuse me, he'll start to work towards uh, building a railroad west from Nashville to Johnsonville and put a new port on the deeper and bigger Tennessee River. So what are his solutions? Create more cavalry. One of the brilliant solutions that came from Washington City to William Stark Rosecrans by telegraph was, why don't you put a bunch of guys in wagons and chase them using that? And Rosecrans said, you've obviously never been to Middle Tennessee to see how crummy the roads are, but that would work great on Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Washington. There's actually a point in the Chickamauga Chattanooga campaign where Montgomery Banks Quartermaster General, who's a genius of a man, comes down and actually apologizes to Rosecrans. I had no idea 
this kind of terrain was what you're dealing with. Yeah, because it doesn't stick up on your maps. You're looking at a one-dimensional map and you can't tell how bad these mountain ranges are in the hills of Middle Tennessee. Creates a Pioneer Corps. My friend Tom, Thomas and I were talking about Napoleon. Let's talk about Napoleon stuff. I like technique. Um, but pretty good uniforms. Thomas is, is a Milwaukee ironmonger. He has a business here and he's making iron implements for farms like plows. And he's making implements for the railroad. Uh, you know, parts for locomotives. And that's what his, his skill trade is. So why on God's green earth should he be slugging a musket and fighting with the Yonke Yonke of Wisconsin somewhere down in Tennessee? Makes no sense, right? And, and you, sir, you run an iron furnace. You make the iron that he buys and turns into a finished product. Why should you be doing the same thing? So that's what Rosecrans does with the Pioneer Corps. He reaches out to the Army of the Cumberland and says, all of you who have skilled trades, I mean carpenters, woodsmen, iron people, uh, you know, these kind of people, and we're going to form a Pioneer Corps. Engineers. They have cross hatchets or axes on their shoulder patches. These guys would build and repair. They fought. They fought really well at the Battle of Stones River, as a matter of fact, but they're going to be used primarily to build and fix things. So is the first Michigan engineer in mechanics. There's a great book that came out of them about 10 years ago. There was also a Missouri engineer unit. These guys could fight, but their skills were to build and fix things. And Sherman is going to lean on this thanks to what William Stark Rosecrans creates. And one of the things that he does, because on Forrest's birthday in 1862, I just had the picture of the courthouse there, is he celebrates by bagging an entire Union Brigade at Murfreesboro, including some Minnesota troops. So what Rosecrans does is he goes about 30 miles down the line to just north of the town of Murfreesboro and builds the largest earthen fort ever built in North America. 200 acres, 57 heavy guns zeroed out to two, 3,000 yards all the way around. And of course, some of those guns are aimed at the town of Murfreesboro, reminding the people of Murfreesboro who's running the show in the neighborhood. Because that was a hotbed of secessionism. Uh, you can see the, the curtain wall on the bottom. The part that's still left are uh, Redoubt Brandon, Redoubt Schofield, and this little bit right here. All the rest of that is gone. The Park Service now owns that. It's run by Stones River Battlefield. Uh, and just to give you a code from the artillery reenactors, you have a, a local restaurant called Toots on this site and another restaurant, um, not Twin Peaks, it's the, the it's a restaurant like Twin Peaks, but it's more well known than Twin Peaks. So the code is, are we going to, to uh, Lunette, was it Lunette Crittenden or Lunette McCook for dinner? I mean, are we going to Toots or the Twin Peaks like restaurant? So you have to learn to crack that code. Within this complex are sawmills, warehouses, the pontoon boats that Sherman's going to use in the Atlanta campaign are made there. The prefab trestle used to repair the railroad bridges, made there. And then a month plus worth of supplies stockpiled. I once asked Jim Lewis, who's a ranger in Stones River, so what if Wood, instead of going to Franklin, turned east and attacked Fortress Rosecrans? That 8,000 men, the 57 pieces of big guns and stuff, and he just started laughing. He said there would have been nothing left of Hood's army. They would have been slaughtered. There's no way they're going to take it. Here's your radar map. You can just kind of get an idea of, of your ranges. There's your artillery ranges. There's the town of Murfreesboro here. Uh, gentleman from the 34th Illinois did not enlist to get a job of working, expecting a big picnic with good clothes. Instead, we're building this big, stupid thing. That's not what he signed up for, evidently. So let's look at what logistics means in terms of the basic soldier. What do these guys have to have? This is the color guard of the 7th Illinois with their Henry repeaters, which did a lot of damage to the Confederates at Alatoona Pass. You need shoes and uniforms, accoutrements, weapons, and ammunition. That's going to be your basic thing that an infantryman is going to carry. Both sides pretty much the same thing. Shelter tents, tools, food. There's your food ration, 12 ounces of pork and bacon. Got to have that bacon. Everything's better than bacon. I don't care what it is. Four ounces of beef, flour, and of course, the most important thing in the God's great art to them, coffee. I've never been in the military, but everybody I know that has, it's coffee. Got to have coffee. Love the smell, hate the taste. Union cavalrymen, kind of the same sort of thing. Very similar, except you're going to add a little bit because you've got horseshoes, horse accoutrements, saddles, tack, things like that, blankets, food rations the same, and then now the horse eats minimum 20 pounds of, of fodder a day. 25 is better. 
because these animals are going to need a lot of calories to do what they do so they don't break down. And you have your mixture of food. You don't just give them hay or let them graze the grass. You try to mix it up for their calorie. You know our children, same thing. Now you've got the battery horses, similar to what the calorie needs are. Now you've got the ammo wagons, the battery wagons, the shop wagons so they can fix things. Same thing, limbers and caissons, hauling ammunition. Same thing, those guys need supply, those animals need supply as well. This is getting bigger. That is my favorite picture of a U.S. Army wagon train. Look at that. That's, that's just a stunning, stunning picture. The Teamsters who are driving the wagons also have to be supplied, as do the six mules or horses, typically mules, pulling the wagons. So if you've got on a flat ground, a wagon can carry up to 3,000 pounds of fodder. Out of that comes six times 20 to 25 pounds per day for each of the animals pulling the wagon. So that means every day you're marching and not resupplying that fodder, that fodder pile gets a little bit smaller. And you hope you get to the end point while you still got something left to deliver on the other side. So they've got to eat that stuff. Then you've got the maintenance for the wagons. They've got your wagon wheels fall off, thing, you know, things happen. Um, ordnance. Weapons, ammunition, quartermaster supplies carry all that stuff. Food for the troops, fodder for the animals, especially like in North Georgia where Sherman's going to go, there's not going to be much living off the land. This is not Georgia farm country. That's south of Atlanta to the Florida state line and down southeast towards Savannah. The largest agricultural belt of the entire Confederacy. Not that mythical Shenandoah Valley thing. I, I've studied this for a long time. I have found not one bushel of corn going from the Shenandoah Valley to Georgia, but starting in the spring of 1863, Georgia corn to the tune of 5,000 bushels a day is going to Lee's Army in Virginia from Georgia. Now, who's defending that? Braxton Bragg in Middle Tennessee. So he sent his commissary guys down to the Atlanta Depot to fill requisitions. Go pound sand, General Bragg. All this is going to Virginia. So he has to start pulling out of Alabama and Mississippi. So that's something to also consider on the Confederate side. Here's your supply and delivery system. The vehicle on the left is an actual 20th Corps wagon. It's at the Atlanta History Center today. Go see it. Uh, by the way, they've opened the Cyclorama and the locomotive Texas has all been redone. Uh, I was hoping to get there last Saturday when I was down there, but we didn't have time. Um, but the wagon is a lot bigger than you think. It's a very large wagon, and it has travel honors painted on the side. It came west with the 11th and 12th Corps, got renumbered to the 20th Corps, fought under Hooker during the Atlanta campaign, and then went on the march of the sea. And all of that is painted on the sides of the wagon right there. So that wagon's been around. I don't know how many Civil War wagons still exist. That's the only one I know of. So let's look at 1863. This comes courtesy of my friend Jim Ogden, the historian at Chickamauga, Chattanooga. I wanted to tell you an idea of what a Union Corps is going to carry. Now keep in mind, uh, Rosecrans Army at that time only had four corps, and the, including Gordon Granger's Reserve Corps. So Sherman's Army is significantly bigger, but this gives you an idea in microcosm. So what the regiment, this is McCook's 20th Corps here, um, what the regiment had, three wagons per regiment carrying that stuff right there, 38 regiments times three, there's 114 wagons just for the regiments. Battery wagons, there's your Artillery, they had nine batteries times three, there's 27 more wagons. So we're pushing up uh, 150. Brigade headquarters, three wagons per headquarters, carrying the things you see, nine brigades times three, 27 more wagons. Division headquarters, 10 per three divisions, 30 more wagons. We are now north of 200 wagons for the Corps. We're not done. Ammo wagons, 54. Your soldier carried 40 to 50 rounds in the haversack and the cartridge box, and then there was 110 rounds per man in the wagon train. The ammo wagons carried per man another 110 rounds. 29 wagons estimated for your batteries, 250 rounds per gun, your tool wagons, trenching tools, things for the pioneer troops, engineers. So we can see we're getting a lot more wagons here. Supply wagons holding the rations, 438 for 24 days. Medical wagons, total for the 20th Corps, September 63, right there, 751, 105 ambulances, and all those critters. Pull them around. Get an idea how big that is. In the Tullahoma campaign, there's a great picture there of a Union wagon train in, in the east, nose to tail. 
Rose Crane's wagon train, if you line it up on one road, was 35 miles long. In other words, while he's down pushing towards beyond Murfreesboro, the last wagon is just leaving Nashville. If you were to line them all up on one road, that's how long that is. So they give you an idea of the size and scope. So Sherman wants to make a few changes. If you read this thing in the official records, I want to make my armies more nimble. I want to be able to move faster. Uh, this man is, is an ADD guy to the 50th power. You know, four or five hours of sleep at night. He's irritable. He's tense. He's constantly in motion, constantly thinking. So he wants to reduce the number of wagons per regiment. So he's going to drop two wagons each. So right there, you lose almost 700 wagons. So he's off to a pretty good start. That means his army will be a little faster, and his troops are just going to have to lug more stuff on their back. So they'll carry four days rations instead of six, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They'll carry a half a tent. So I've got half the pup tent. Tom's got the other half of the pup tent. And we just put up our little stakes, and, and there's our pup tent. If he's killed or wounded, or I'm killed or wounded, he's got to go find somebody else to, met, to tent with him. Or, or drag both parts of the tent around. But despite the reduction, according to the quartermaster officer, Easton, Sherman's army has that many wagons, about 52 per 1,000 men. That's not much different than what Rosecrans had the previous year. Partly because he's got a much bigger army. Rosecrans is 65 to 70,000 troops. Sherman's got 115,000. So he's got a lot more guys to have to deal with, a lot more animals. I'll double back here. How many of you read Albert Castell's Decision in the West, which is the best single volume if you want to read on the Atlanta campaign? I love his May entry as the campaign kicks off. And it's hot and it's dusty in Georgia as, as it can sometimes be um, when you haven't had a lot of rain yet. And you can see the troops marching, like during the Chickamauga campaign, there was a drought. You can see the troops marching just by the dust. But one of the, the great lines he talked about in there is the Confederates could smell Sherman's army long before they saw Sherman's army. <laughs> Let your imagination wander with that statement. So, in addition to the wagon trains at that level, up to, from brigade to army level, the wagons would also be used to haul supplies from the railhead. So as every town Sherman captures in Georgia, the railroad will be repaired to that point, and then he will pile on 30 days worth of supplies into that town. And then they will pull wagon trains from there, from the railhead to the wagon guys in the field, drop off things to the other wagons, then those wagons will supply the Corps Brigade's divisions. And then the other wagon train will go back to the railhead and get more supplies. So those guys are constantly doing one giant loop while the guys on the other end are dispersing the products of that loop to the people in the field and then sending in more requisitions. We need more of this, more of that. And keeping in mind that you're shooting every day a couple hundred thousand rounds in a week are being expended in the Atlanta campaign. That's a lot of shooting, even though you don't have that many pitched battles. So let's look at Sherman's Railroad. That's the uh, Nashville Northwestern Railroad west of Kingston, heading towards uh, Johnsonville. The thin main iron line is the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, running from Nashville through Gallatin. The tunnel was right there. The Morgan dropped up to Bowling Green, and then up to the Ohio River port in Louisville. And what he tells his brother, Senator, Senator John Sherman, is worried. Long and single line of supply to my rear, limited capacity is the delicate part of the game. How do I protect that line in Kentucky? What do I have to do? Here's Nashville in 1864. Nashville did, that's the Nashville Decatur. It stopped and started there. But here's the LNN coming in in time with the Nashville in Chattanooga. That's the fortified bridge that they will build. These bridge piers are still used by another bridge on that site right there today. Sherman's Railroad to Tennessee. There's your LNN we talked about. This was the Memphis and Edgefield Railroad, the, excuse me, the Edgefield and National Railroad that ran up to the town of Graysville. Uh, it's just outside of where I live. There's where I live in Clarksville. That's the Memphis Clarksville Louisville right there. And then they will extend from Kingston Springs out to Johnsonville. That's Rosecrans pro uh, Project, early 1863, the National and Northwestern Railroad. Because of the water level problems on the Cumberland River, they're moving the basic port out to Johnsonville. They'll still use the Cumberland after rainstorms, but Johnsonville is going to become the big thing. Notice these two railroads. Here's the Nashville and Decatur. Here's the Nashville and Chattanooga. And what Sherman is going to do is trains willing with supplies will come down to Stevenson, come to Chattanooga, offload there, and then as the railroad, as the campaign moves into Georgia, load them onto other trains, push into Georgia. Then the empty trains, along with wounded, will come back this way to Decatur and then take the Nashville Decatur back to Nashville. So it's a big circle very efficient use of predominantly single line track. They'll build sidings 
and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Here are some types of rails that you're going to find in Tennessee. Thankfully, not much strap rail was still left. There's your cross tie, a wooden stringer, and then an iron bar tacked down. Can you already see the problem with what's wrong with that kind of a rail? I don't know about you guys, it gets hot and humid in the south. Uh, and, and that wood's going to rot, and those spikes will loosen up. And there are accounts of the rail popping up like this and skewering a train car or a locomotive and, and pretty much causing a derailment. Stunningly enough, when Lovell Rousseau hit the line that goes to Montgomery, Alabama from West Point, Georgia, that rail line was still strapped. And he talks about how easy it was to get the crowbars under there to pull to pull it up off of the stringers. A uh, piece of cake. All the ones in Tennessee had pretty much been replaced. The first replacement was imported British U-Rail. Only made in England, brought into the United States prior to the war. Uh, they still find some at the Tennessee River Bridge. You have to dive into the river and they'll pull up a section and cut it up and, and sell little pieces. This is actual rail from the Western and Atlantic Railroad. Now, if you go out to your local railroad track, somewhere along the, the, the rail will be a number. And that number stands for pounds per yard. And I think on the main lines today, it's about 250 to 300 pounds per yard. And for trunk lines, it's down about 100 and a half to 175, which means they're not carrying as much rail traffic. But you'll see that on every rail made today. So here's your modern rail, and here's your 1858 to 64 rail. It's significantly smaller, plus it's made of iron and not steel. But you can go to the Railroad Museum in Tunnelville, Georgia, and you can see, actually you can see all of these right there for you. So Sherman's minimum standard is 130 cars, boxcars, flatcars per day, hauling 10 tons of supplies into Chattanooga. That's the minimum he is going to accept. Here's Chattanooga uh, right here. There's the Nashville Marshalling Yards uh, in what we call the Gulch today. Now, steamboats will carry supplies to Louisville, will offload on trains. Steamboats will carry supplies to Nashville right here, offload, come through the town, and the rail yards on the other side. And then here's the depot they will build at uh, Chattanooga with the smaller steamboats on the Tennessee River. That's Lookout Mountain, and that's Cameron Hill, which is now flatter in a giant hospital sitting on top of Cameron Hill today. But you can go in downtown Chattanooga and have ice cream and drinks where those warehouses were uh, 155, 160 years ago. His quartermaster in charge of steamboat transportation uh, in Nashville talking about weeks the levees thronging with transports. He's got 3,000 men, four to 500 teams, constantly working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, moving stuff from the river to the National Chattanooga National Cater Warehouses. They will actually build a trunk railroad around the nose of Capitol Hill to make it a little bit faster. If you've been to downtown Nashville, if you are at the river, you're going uphill to where our state capital is, and then you're downhill into the Gulf. So they decided to um, make that a little bit easier. Two to 3,000 tons of freight, that's not counting what comes in by train. Daily, that's a lot. Louis Parsons started out the war as a transportation officer in St. Louis. He was from Central Illinois. His papers were at the University of Illinois. Uh, I have copies of some of this. There from his report is how many steamboats were coming in by month and how much the tonnage was. So your average tonnage in February of 64 is 201 tons. March it goes up to 294. Sherman is ramping it up. Give me more steamboats, give me more steamboats. And he's now a department commander, so he's got the ear of the president, he's got the ear of Grant, he's got the ear of Stanton, whoever he needs, he, and he's got a brother in the United States Senate, John Sherman, as in the Sherman Antitrust Act, by the way. He resorted to draconian supply measures. That's an understatement. What does he tell Donaldson? If you don't have my army supply, we'll eat your mules up, sir. We will eat your mules up. Sherman's not kidding. To the Christian Commission, crackers and oats are more necessary to my army than a moral religious agency. Show me that your presence of the front is more valuable than 200 pounds of powder, or oats, or bread. And then to his wife, crowds of idlers and sanitary agents, Christian commissioners, all curiosity hunters loading down our cars, railroad cars. It was the Gordian knot, and I cut it. How does he maximize his railroad lift capacity? What happened in the spring, late winter and spring of 1864 in the Union Army? Veteranized regiments. If your 8th Wisconsin Infantry decided to re-enlist in, in that time frame, you got a 30-day furlough, you got something like what, a $300 bonus, uh, and you got even more if you brought a bunch of guys back to join the ranks of the 8th Wisconsin, 
And you could take the train, you know, all the way up here. I don't know how the railroads ran through Illinois into Milwaukee. Um, I know the Illinois Central went from Chicago to Cairo at the time. I don't know north of Chicago. But, you know, you could get home, see your family, maybe grab a couple of recruits. Hey, come on, we're having a great time. We're going to Georgia. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be hot under blazes, but don't worry about it. We'll get good Braves tickets. Um, and, and Led Zeppelin tickets in 1973. Uh, think, you know, enticements to get guys to join the Army. Yeah, you'll see Led Zeppelin. No, they don't exist yet. Don't worry about it. Um, then they show up, but they take the train as far as Nashville or the steamboat as far as Nashville. So how do they get from Nashville to Chattanooga? No train rides. US 41, baby. Over the Cumberland Mountains. And oh, by the way, take these 3,000 head of beef and 4,000 head of hogs with you. I've got wonderful accounts of veteranized regiments marching to Chattanooga hauling animals along with them, because even those weren't going to make it on the trains. Sherman had other plans with those railroad cars heading down to Chattanooga. A railroad, and then of course, no rations for people, the civilians living in the National Air, they don't have the room. There's this depot, so all like Robert Allen runs uh, the Louisville Depot up here in Louisville, Kentucky, train on the LN, uh, Union Cavalry Unit marching by there. So what do they build up in, in uh, Louisville? 10 million rations and 4,300,000 rations per day. There were bakers there making hardtack. There was a big bakery complex in Cairo, Illinois. There were food suppliers in Cincinnati and Evansville and all these river cities sending their supplies. Chicago by rail, Indianapolis by rail, whatever. Processing hogs, receiving a thousand head of cattle. You did not slaughter your cattle and issue them as rations. Have you ever tried salt beef? Don't. <laughs> salt pork you can handle. Salt beef, that's why beef is kept on the hook. You can slaughter your hogs, create your pork rations, salt them down, they're not so bad. It's like Smithfield, Virginia ham. Conduit for supplies from all of these depots coming into Louisville, heading on down the railroad to Chattanooga. Here's the National Depot system. That's the Eaton Quartermaster Depot. These are all on the National Decatur, by the way. There's the Forge House down below. There's the Gulch Railroad Yard right there. Actual pictures of this. There's the Taylor Commissary Depot. These depots are located Here's the National Chattanooga, that's National Decatur. They're right about here, right where the track turned and joined. So 1,700 feet long, that's a big building back in those days. And it was double, double spaced, because that was, you can see there's a second story there, because of the slope of downtown Nashville. So the upper levels were the trade carts that pull in, and then the lower level is for wagons coming in from the, uh, the river. The quartermaster department of the Cumberland is James Donaldson, and he's estimates of 108 million pounds of forage. This isn't with 18 wheelers on the interstate, folks. These are wagons hauling this kind of stuff. 60,000 animals had arrived in Nashville by May 1, 40, 40 to 60 cars of grain per day. But the Cumberland River will slow the arrival because of water problems. The Nashville Depot had over 13,000 workers. There's a killer book that I want you to all run right out to Amazon because you can't buy the books over anymore, but Amazon's still got it. It's called The Supply for Tomorrow Must Not Fail by Lynette Taylor. He's a young quartermaster captain, early 20s from Akron, Ohio. His papers are at the Akron Historical Society. Dr. Lynette, or Dr. Taylor got to go through them and wrote this amazing book. And it's not boring, it's not dry facts and figures, it's a really entertaining, hilarious book. He started off his day typically by going to the Nashville City Jails and bailing out the drunken Irish laborers that worked in the warehouses on the Cumberland River. Now, I'm part Irish, and yes, I will bend an elbow with some Guinness. You betcha. And, and those guys bend more than an elbow with some Guinness at the end of the day of hard work. So they're hitting the saloons of Nashville, and he's going to bail them out. And so it gives you a good idea of what the quartermaster department was like. Chattanooga Depot is the advanced depot. He's going to pile on a bunch of stuff there to draw from for at least 70 days. What's the point of these advanced depots? If Confederate cavalry gets in between them and cuts the railroad, he can draw from the nearest depot closest to his front line and keep things going while these guys repair the railroad and drive off those pesky weapons. Here's Chattanooga, what it looked like. There's Cameron Hill right there where the hospital is nowadays. Look out, it's over here. Um, notice this nice little warehouse right here. You see these little contraptions on the top? What's that warehouse made out of? Wood. What happens when fire and wood meet? Not good things. There's your fire department right there. Those are rain barrels loaded with water. 
And they were just, they had a hose dropping down, they just turned a valve on and they had instant, instant fire suppression. Bridgeport, Alabama, where the National Chattanooga crosses the Tennessee River. Uh, they built a small depot there. This depot actually comes into existence during the Chattanooga campaign. They will build small steamboats here, actually throw some guns on them, and they will haul supplies into Chattanooga once Grant opens up the cracker line. Uh, that's where it is to the right of the railroad bridge. You can go there now and walk across the Period Bridge. They put a footpath across it, and right next to the modern uh, railroad bridge that's there. Um, here's some of the depots that they've advanced. That's a Daresville, Alexander Pass. That's Vinings, that's Alexander Pass right there, taken from the Union Fort, which is on that hill, there's another one there. Uh, both forts are still there, by the way. Uh, and then Vinings, that's where Sherman will see Atlanta for the first time on top of the, the Vinings Mountain, right there, and you will see the spires of the city of Atlanta in the distance. That will be his final railhead for the rest of the campaign. From that point on, it's wagon train across the Chattahoochee and then to his three armies in the field. So also with supply problems, I have to rebuild the railroads in Tennessee because Bragg had destroyed bridges as he retreated, ripped up track and things of that nature, and the old tracks were just worn out. So over the winter of 63, 64, you can read this in the official records, that's what they do. Every inch of the National Chattanooga and the National Decatur and the railroad going out to Johnsonville are completely rebuilt. Every tie, every spike, every rail. What'd you do in the winter of 63, 64, Daddy? <laughs> Here's the rebuilt corn, what they call the Cornstalk Bridge of Whiteside. There it is today with I-24 running right under it. On the way to about 30 miles outside of Chattanooga. You can run right, uh, right through it. Broke through there the other day, as a matter of fact. Uh, I had to get out on the freeway to get that picture, so I risked my life for you folks. <laughs> Literally had to jump out of the because I had the picture in one hand trying to match up that angle. My wife thinks I'm a complete idiot, trust me. <laughs> here's, here's your railroad bridge. Bragg had torn that down. There's Rosecrans building the pontoon. There's the bridge you can walk on today. Here's some of the, the uh, trestle bridge that will be built later on as they're building bridges like over Chickamauga Creek and things of that nature. Union engineering in this campaign is, is nothing short of phenomenal. So here's what they rebuild. There's your distances. Of all those railroads, that gets rebuilt. Every inch of that line. But Daniel McCallum was the U.S. military railroad. He's a Herman Hauf protege. Um, this guy needs a biography in the worst possible way. But fortunately, you can go onto Google Books and look at his report because it's not in the ORs. That's his report from July 65. 877 miles of railroad. National Chattanooga new for the entire length. New sightings at Deckard, Stevenson, Alabama, 19 miles alone because a lot of these places only had a short sighting. Cowan at which is just south of Decker, a few miles, and what's called the Pusher District, because you have this steep incline going up to the Cowan Tunnel, 2,280 feet through the tunnel, hand dug, by the way, then down into the steep incline into the Tennessee River Valley. And within that tunnel, your track does this. Cowan, Tennessee River. So you set your brakes, even today, in the middle of that tunnel. And you, the pushers will uncouple, and then the train will roll on down, the pushers will follow to the non-existent town of Tantalon, and then wait for the next northbound freight. Now the pushers operate out of Decker. Uh, if there's 100 plus cars on the train, the pushers show up. And they, they push, they, that's what they do. Look at that, these are all of his figures from McCallum's report. Under, unbelievable, water, water tanks, locomotives, see locomotives need to have water, right? But they blow up. The water gets too low in the, in the engine and it will blow up machine shops, new bridges, trestles, new tons of railroad iron. Those foundries up north were cranking it out. And the Confederates were sitting there going, God, I wish we could do that. What was happening to their railroad iron? A thing called the Confederate Navy, getting all of it for iron class. Louisville Nashville is also completely rebuilt. That's the bridge over Green River at Munferville, which is a neat little battlefield, by the way. Here's his railroad team. I cannot find a picture of Adna Anderson. I think he's the same guy that ran, uh, that was the engineer that first laid out Fort Donaldson uh, when he was on the Confederate side of things. Because how many guys were named Adna Anderson uh, back in those days? He ran the Department of Transportation. That's James Guthrie, the Louisville National Railroad, and of course the amazing Herman Haupt. If you've all seen the Ken Burns Civil War thing at the end, he says, there were two great geniuses of the war, Nathan Bedford Forrest and Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to add two more, Herman Howells being one of the two, Josiah Gorgas and the Confederate Orders Bureau being the other of the two. Howells is an amazing man. An amazing man. 
And Guthrie is an interesting guy. Sherman will come to Guthrie and use patriotism. Mr. Guthrie, I am in need of capacity, rolling stock and locomotives and tonnage and things like that. And by the way, the government's only paying this rate. There is no discussion. Your lawyer doesn't talk to me. Because I'll probably shoot him along with the newspaper guys. <laughs> no, you hope those guys who want to hang out. Um, Sherman didn't like newspaper men. Um, and Guthrie goes, uh, okay, General Sherman, no problem. So it's a column A, you do what I say, column B, I just take over your railroad and let that guy out run it for you. So that's what will happen uh, during the war on the northern side. So getting more transportation, more locomotives, and more cars to get all this done. So he writes to Guthrie, this by the way, take your memoirs with a grain of salt. And this is courtesy of the late Albert Castell, who after he did his book on the Atlanta campaign, wrote an essay that appeared, I think, in military, no, no, military Civil War history called William Tecumseh Sherman Prevaricating Through Georgia. And what he does is he takes an account from the memoirs and then looks at the same episode from the official records written at or not long after the event took place. And you will see significant differences in there. Okay? Here's what he tells Guthrie in his, whoops, in his memoir. I write to him, Guthrie, appeal your patriotism, hold all the locomotives coming into Jeffersonville, Indiana, as across the Ohio River from Louisville, which by the way is where the Louisville Depot was. The buildings are still there. Arrange a ferry boat, ship them over the river, and for a short time we had cars from almost every road in the north. I was amused to see cars marked Pittsburgh and Fort Wayne, Delaware and Lackawanna, Baltimore and Ohio, and not a word of that is true. Because the gauges. I will have to look up and see what gauge each of these railroads were, but if they're not five foot gauge, they're not rolling in Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia. They tried a system in 1863 where they were going to widen or narrow the gauges of the carriage. The, the thing that went underneath the car, the locomotive, that you know, narrow the gauge or widen the gauge, it was unsafe. After the war, they came up with the Ramsey transfer system, where they would roll the car off, drop the hole, and slam a whole new carriage on there. And then that gets replaced when they, hey, let's just make all the railroads the same gauge. So that, that didn't last long. So this isn't going to work. So at the start of the campaign, U.S. Military Railroad, 47 locomotives, three bar from the LNN, 11 are repaired. There's some of the cars he's got, another 100 bar from the LNN, from his good buddy Guthrie, elbow to the ribs. McCallum estimates 200 locomotives and 3,000 cars are needed just to meet Sherman's demand of 130 cars a day. So Sherman will order Adam to Anderson to press locomotives from the other Kentucky railroads, which are all five foot gate. That'll get him some more engines there and cars. Stanton will authorize McCallum to buy from all your railroad makers in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. By the way, they all have to be five feet. Okay, we can do that. That's where Sherman's cars came from. The factories of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So you look at that, 119 New Orleans, 1,700 cars, new cars. Zero on the odometer. At Robert Allen, all the engines coming from the east, it, it's just amazing what Sherman can pull off at this time. Railroad repair shops, because sometimes trains do that. And you have to fix them. They were doing that a lot in the Confederate railroad system because the iron rails were wearing out. By the end of the war, Confederate trains can't go more than five miles per hour or they will literally roll off the track because they weren't able to replace the railroads. Ties stockpiled as the, they will build a rail factory in Chattanooga that it's not done in time, it will come online just after the war and will keep making rails in the Deep South quite some time, there's a bunch of rail there, because the Confederates will do things like this, or Sherman will do things like that, that's an actual Sherman necktie. Now this guy invented, if the rail's not so badly bent, a device that you just move it along, and you can actually sort of straighten the iron rail out to a point. If it's badly bent, you just send that back to the foundry, melt it down, and re-roll another rail. Those lines, those tracks can't be uh, fixed. And then I've already talked about the Cumberland River, uh, there's the Harpeth Shoals right there, there's an actual article of the River News, showing you what the, the steamboat guys are looking at. And then the National Northwestern, the Great Cup's still there. Uh, that bridge has been filled in. That bridge is now a baseball park. Uh, there's still the track nominally running through that area, and a lot of the Union forts built to protect it are still there. So by May of 1861, Sherman is really happy to see all of this has come to pass, 
And he says, I'm never easy with a railroad that takes the whole army to guard. He's worried about the deeper I go to Georgia, the more people I have to leave back to protect things. Every commander in history has had that problem. The closer we got to Germany in World War II, the more we had to build things, protect things. Not so much protect things, but still build things. They can't stop the Tennessee River, is what he means there. No, they couldn't. Well, maybe they could. In early November 1864, this guy shows up and destroys the Johnsonville Depot. Seven million dollars worth of damage. I forget what that is in 2019 dollars, but it's a lot. Took the Johnsonville Depot down. Colonel William Innes was a Michigan Engineers and Mechanics. They will build these blockhouses. Here, that's the Whiteside Railroad Bridge that I-24 goes under nowadays. They're good at building those things to protect bridge points like you see there. There they are after the Tullahoma campaign. That is the Elk River Bridge in Allisonia around Mount Estill Springs. There's the modern bridge today, the Highway 41 bridge. That's taken looking towards uh, the east. I had a Tullahoma tour a few months ago out there, and uh, right where the, on the opposite side of where this was, the police officer came up like, what are you guys doing? This is like a drug deal? And, no, it's a support tour. And, and I had that picture on my phone. I said, you ever see what your bridge looked like in 1863? There you go. That's cool. Because I guess the drug deals went on in that whole park. Here's Sherman's secret weapon, and somebody needs to write about this guy. Colonel William Wright commanded the railroad brigade of 3,000 troops. These guys have preloaded flat cars and box cars with ties, spikes, rails, tools, whatever shovels, picks, whatever else they needed to fix a railroad. In one instance in the Atlanta campaign where Wheeler's Cavalry got north of Ackworth, Georgia and started ripping up the track, one of his trains happened to be a couple miles away and rolls right up to it. His first guys get off, form line of battle, drive Wheeler away, and as they push the Confederates off the railroad, here comes the next wave of guys with rails, with picks and axes and hammers, and they're rip, they're retacking rail. If there's a new rail needed, there's a new rail that goes down. That's when Dennis Kelly kind of saw out and said, how do you beat an army that can build, rebuild the railroad during combat? You can't. Repairing bridges. That's what they call, the, the Union called the Beanstalk or Cornstalk bridges. This is the Yellow River, there's the piers today. There's a fort on the hill, um, still there. There's a picture of it where I was literally standing on the railroad track in an acoustic shadow, and I put the camera down, and 50 yards away comes a bridge. I said, I best move. Um, so that, yeah, that fort still, these are forts are gone. But there's your, your first bridge, the Beanstalk Bridge. And then when they got time, there's that prefab trestle that came from Fortress Rosecrans. They rolled it down, ripped up the Beanstalk Bridge, laid down the heavier duty stuff, and the trains could go a lot faster. I don't know how long a cross like that guy's doing. That's going to be a really slow three or four mile an hour, because you know that bridge is swaying. But it kept, it kept the supplies going. E.C. Smead, a hot protege civilian engineer, that bridge you just saw, there's your stats, 625 feet, 75 feet high, rebuilt, six days, 600 men. Gets better. Here's the Chattahoochee River Bridge, even longer, four and a half days, there's your trestle going in there, there's your cornstalk bridge. Just unbelievable stuff that these guys could do back in those days. Sherman's guesstimate is that the railroad replaces 37,000 wagons, hence all of the preparation, all the sweat and the blood and the worry and the sleepless nights and, and detaching engineers and competent people to handle his rear echelon supply and railroad repair. Improvise out of materials on the spot. Fortunately for him, he's moving through a very heavily wooded part of Georgia. More rural area fortifications. That's Fort Negley in Nashville. That's the biggest limestone fort ever built. That's the fort over in Waverly, Tennessee on the Nashville Northwestern. That's our fort Defiance in Clarksville. And here in Dalton, Georgia was Fort Hill. Uh, that was manned by the 44th USCT and were captured by Hood on the Tennessee campaign in October of 64. But these forts and railroad guards and everything else were not enough. He will create the district of the Etowa under James Stedman. He will have uh, William Lowe from Iowa, 5th Iowa Cavalry Colonel originally, not commanding a division, and uh, Brigadier General John Smith commanding a division of troops. He'll have up to 15,000 troops, and they're going to be patrolling the area between Altoona Pass here and all the way back to Dalton. That is their area of responsibility particularly around Alatoona, because that's what Sherman says, it's a second Chattanooga. So they'll build new warehouses there, new sightings, 
Forti heavy fortifications there that are still there to this day. That's Sherman to the 10th power for rear echelon protection. Then the other thing, tying down that guy in Mississippi. Two full corps are detached, one in Memphis, one in Vicksburg. Their job is to make sure force never leaves the state of Mississippi, even gets to Alabama, Middle Tennessee, God forbid. Forrest is leaving in early June. He makes it to Russellville, Alabama. When his boss, then boss Stephen Dill Lee, who's replaced Polk, commanding that department, you better hustle on back. There's a powerful Union force coming out of Memphis. That was Samuel Sturgis. June 10, 1864, Forrest wins the brilliant battle of Bryce's Crossroads and destroys Sturgis' army on the retreat. It took him seven days to get to Bryce's Crossroads. It took him 36 hours to get back to Memphis with Forrest nipping at his heels the whole way. But it was a strategic defeat. What did that destruction of Sturgis' army do? Where was Forrest? Mississippi. The next powerful column came out of Memphis, beat him at Tupelo Harrisburg, Forrest will attack Memphis, Forrest never gets on Sherman's railroad. Merrill makes, Merrill makes the pontoons right there because you're going to be laying pontoon bridges to you repair your road bridges and get those up in place. Built again at Fortress Rosecrans. And then nobody talks about the United States Navy. I even go talk now on the US Navy and the Tennessee campaign because nobody talks about it except Ben Cooling in his book. So you've got tin clad gunboats. That is the USS Fairplay. That was photographed in my town, Clarkston, by the local photographer. That's one of your timber clads. That's either, I can't remember if it's a Lexington Tyler Conestoga. There's one of your city clads, iron clads. And that man is Leroy Finch. He's a brilliant gunboat commander. He is involved in the Morgan Raid in Ohio. He's at Buffington Island. He's involved in stopping Hood getting across the Cumberland River to Nashville. So he's a veteran gunboat commander. These guys will escort the convoys. They'll patrol. They'll go to the areas where the choke points are because they know where they are too, like in Harper Shoals and like in Palmyra. And they'll station what warships there to keep the Confederates from getting in there and doing anything dastardly. So what went right in Sherman's Atlanta campaign from a logistics point of view? You got enough locomotives and cars, you grateful to Mr. Guthrie. I like to sense enough of patriotism enough to subordinate the interests of his railroad to the interests of the country, or else, <laughs> he left that part out. Overall supplies, I doubt if any army went forth to battle with fewer impediments, just piles of supplies. Unknown Union quartermaster had to lay the whole north under contribution. Keep in mind, there's other things going on in the war besides Sherman going to Atlanta, right? At this time? You got the war that transmits, France doing or something in the east. Organization was wagon trains, you got 200,000 rounds a day as the Atlanta campaign will kick off. You got the ordnance trains, and then you got the field trains, you know, going from the railheads to the front, and then your trains working within the core. Leapfrogging supply bases, you take Ackworth, then you take Carter or Cartersville and Ackworth, and you build supply bases there. Allocation of garrison forces, it's bigger and better. What went right is where James Cook, he goes beyond Clausewitz and Jomini in terms of understanding and execution of logistics. Atlanta, I love this line, Atlanta's won because Sherman is able to bring a mountain of supplies deep into Georgia. That's it in a nutshell. Stephen Davis, a good friend of mine, again, him up here? I'll send you his email, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal speaker. Carol Meticulous chose abundantly well his drive to secede. Yep. Read any of them. All your one Sherman biographies tonight, I'm going to book report by next week. Because <laughs> you're going to get this as a personality of that man. Phenomenal guy. There's what they shipped out of Nashville between November and September. It's a lot of stuff. Pretty staggering numbers. What went wrong? Forage for animals. That supply is going to ebb and flow. You're going to have the water level on the Cumberland. You're going to have some, uh, some, a little bit of drought in some places. Uh, uh, you know, things of this nature, and we clear the country within 30 miles. You've got some administrative breakdowns where grain is left on flat cars where it gets waterlogged and rots. You're supposed to put that in boxcars, which are much more waterproof. You've got the increase in the army from 60,000 to 75,000 animals, and then the problems again with the Cumberland River that I've talked about. Uh, Amos Beckworth, with only six days of rations, was forced to cut to half rations in the Union Army in August of 64. So not everything is working 100% because there are certain factors. It's the old adage, you could have a great battle plan, but guess what, the enemy has a vote. In every battle in human history, the enemy has a say-so in how that battle turns out. 
The constant problem of cavalry horses, uh, that will carry on into the Tennessee campaign of 1864. The circus is in Nashville, and George Thomas takes all their horses. He even takes Governor Andrew Johnson's horses. We need horses, Governor. So, here's an action where things don't go as Sherman plans. Sherman had been in Georgia in the 1840s as a young officer. He knows the topography of Georgia. This is not new stuff to him. He also carried with him the 1860 Georgia census. Where things were grown, where things were manufactured, here's where I need to go with my army to take things out to really make Georgia hollow. So he comes up to the Altoona Mountains. I can take you to some, not just the, the two Union forts in Altoona Pass are still there. There are Confederate earthworks still throughout that. And Sherman comes up and goes, there's no way I'm going to have my boys attack that. There's this really cool road junction, however, out to the southwest called Dallas. And that gets on the Sandtown Road, which gets below Atlanta, crosses the Chattahoochee at the bank, what's now Bankhead Highway, and goes right into the heart of Atlanta. And it's a lot better terrain down here. So I'm going to load up my army, uh, go away from the railroad for 20 days, and we're going to beat people the road into Dallas, and I'll have the other continents. There's McPherson being the big swing, Schofield being the right, the left flank, and then Thomas up the center, and we'll get to that road, and we'll seize it, and we'll march on into Atlanta before Joe Johnson figures it out. Well, unfortunately for Joe Johnson, Joe Wheeler does a great job as a cavalry officer, whoops, and he picks that movement up. And he reports to Johnson, Sherman is moving out into the Georgia jungle, and he's heading towards the road network of Dallas. So he will detach, Johnson will send a corps out to this area, the New Hope Church area. Rice Bowl, 123rd New York Infantry, his book Soldier, is a great book to read. Same tact, by June 1st, they're going back to the railroad. Why? Because A, they've been stymied in the Georgia jungle, and B, our supplies remaining in our wagons are running low. We have to reestablish contact with the railroad at Ackworth. So it doesn't work. Sherman guesstimates 20 days of supply. They're burning through that at a faster rate than he thought. In June 26, we always see this, this, the accounts of the tattered uniforms of the Confederates, the, the barefoot Confederates. How many of you have seen pictures of the dead Confederates in the Petersburg trenches, the Richmond trenches that are barefoot? None. Why? Because the shoe depots were right there. If you're on a campaign and you're walking from the Rappahannock to Gettysburg, you're going to burn through two pair of programs just getting to Gettysburg. The Union Army does the same thing. So what does Bull say? Our clothes and shoes were in the last stage of existence. They wear out too. Not just Confederate stuff wears out. Easton's account, sometimes ordering 10 days of subsistence brought up, things are, trains are never returned to the north, some are kept in the front by mistakes, the enemy destroys a few, uh, so there are problems. But if you were to ask Bill Sherman today, who are the guys that made the Atlanta campaign possible, those are the guys that he would tell you made the campaign possible. How many of you, other than tonight, how many of you have heard of any of those people? Because you are a very smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that the rest of you aren't, it's just your focus on the Atlanta campaign may be different, right? You may not be looking through the weeds like I was doing for this program tonight. But I want you to understand, anytime you read a battle book or a campaign book, stuff like this had to go on. You don't just get to march anywhere you want. Well, where's your line of supply? That marsh in the way, well, now we better go around that marsh. That road network stinks. Uh, there's no railroad, there's no river. That dictates where an army goes, even today. Although they got airplane, it makes a lot, a lot easier. More on some heroes. That, that guy is a bloody genius. Montgomery man. He wasn't even an engineer. A, uh, a quartermaster by training. He was an engineer. He built the aqueduct, still used by Washington D.C. today, to bring fresh water from the Potomac River. He finished the U.S. Capitol building. He built things. And I guess Lincoln figured out if you can build things, maybe you can run my quartermaster department. And he did. There are several biographies on him out. Please check them out. And that's what Sherman has to say about these men and the railroads and their means to defend them. So what did this all cost? I actually got asked this question in Ohio a couple of years ago. Somebody said, asked me, what's the cost? No, I didn't look that up. So I did. From a college report, $29.6 million, or $19.18, better ramp it up a couple percent now. We're looking at $441 million just to supply the Atlanta campaign. That's not counting pay for troops things of that nature. That's just supplies. So what happens to that great national depot at the end of the war? What happens to all kinds of U.S. Army surplus at the end of the war? The government's broke. 
You want to buy the USS Carondelet? 200 bucks, baby, take it home. I've got invoices from the Louisville Depot selling flags for five bucks. Please, God, invent the time machine. I want to go back and grab me some flags. I'm not sure it will take the modern money, but it'll still say five bucks on it. All of they're selling everything. They, they stripped out the, the depots there. There's some of the stuff that they were selling. And then they sold the buildings. Of course, then the Taylor Depot goes and burns down. But what was left of it, they sell things off just to get some kind of money back into the federal treasury. They, the federal expenditures in this board, there are books on the finance, read them. I'm, I'm not a numbers guy. Uh, I think mathematics is the spawn of Satan, uh, uh, which irritates a friend of mine who's a math teacher. Uh, but I, you know, I just can't rationalize that stuff. But the, it's staggering how much money the U.S. government has spent. So let's rank, in my opinion, the best logistical generals of the American Civil War in order. Number one, hands down, William Tecumseh Sherman, who learned from number two, U.S. Grant in the Vicksburg campaign. Much of what Sherman applies in the Atlanta campaign came out of Grant's application in the Vicksburg campaign. I just reviewed a book for Civil War News written by Tim Smith on Grant's eight main decisions in the Vicksburg campaign. There's a great chapter on, on Grant's logistics in there that teaches Sherman what to do and takes it then. Then the number three guy, William Stark Rosecrans. Fantastic logistician. And then there's something that guy actually could do. Fighting a battle wasn't one of them. Uh, campaigning, okay, but he was a very good logistician, George McClellan. That guy should have never been in a field command. He should have been in Washington ramping up the logistics for the armies in the East. That army would have been far better supplied far earlier had McClellan done something like that. So what does Sherman's logistics make possible in modern war? Well, supposedly Von Milky the Elder was over here as a Prussian observer, he wasn't. Uh, and, and supposedly goes back to Europe and tells his fellow Prussians, what did you learn from observing the American Civil War? And he allegedly says, it was two armed mobs running around chasing each other. Typical Prussian arrogance. He was not here. There were Prussian observers here, just like Arthur Fremantle and other art, art officers from major armies of Europe. What did the Prussians take back to Prussia? Hey, this railroad thing is where it's at. We better build railroads. Now, in the war of German unification, better known to us as the Franco-Prussian War, they made some mistakes. What they didn't do was build trains out into the field as they advanced into France, which caused them logistics problems, like Grant is going to do in the siege of Petersburg, where that USMRR track is just a few miles south of the Confederate trenches, and they're rolling the boxcars right up you know, to, uh, to the front lines. But they get it for World War II, and they will triple track the railroads running east to west. Not so the German people can go visit Russia or Poland or France or Belgium. No, so the German army in World War I and World War II can go visit Prussia or, or Poland and France and Belgium and Russia. There's a killer book on the Battle of Baltimore, a British historian called Snow and Steel, that came out a few years ago. He goes into German logistics like no other historian has. For one, they had 50,000 horses in the ball. The German industry made 700 tons of horseshoes every month. America had more railroad track miles than any nation on the planet. The Germans had three times more rolling stock than we did. Consider that. Culmination of what Sherman did, LSTs, Liberty Ships, One Week, Red Ball Express. These guys studied what Sherman did. They studied what Grant did. And they carried this stuff forward and applied the lessons of a, of a generation or two earlier and carried it forward. The, the weakness of the Red Ball Express is you're hauling fuel to Patton's tanks, but you're burning, burning fuel to get the fuel to Patton's tanks. No different from the guy hauling the fodder in his wagon and then having to feed his mules every day out of that fodder. It still worked. That's what you do. Uh, come to Evansville, Indiana. LST 325 is there. Go on it. It's pretty amazing. They built LSTs in, in Evansville. That's the culmination of what Bill Sherman did in the Atlanta campaign, is what modern logistician officers in the United States military do today. Except they got planes now. <laughs> they're, they're much happier having aircraft. But thank you very much for having me, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate it. And some questions if anybody would like to. Books for sale, they can go from my house to yours. Okay, go ahead. 
column. Yeah, in other words, you had to tell if you were uh, a wagon train master, you had to be told that if you take this road, you had to be there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going by 4 and be back here by 6 o'clock. I haven't seen it that regimented. The railroads are much more regimented. The rolling, the uh, locomotives of the day had enough locomotive power to pull a 12, 15 car train up to 50 miles an hour. But on, I know from the Western Atlantic experience, a train leaving Atlanta at six in the morning doesn't get to Chattanooga until sometime at night. And there are reasons for that. One, you get to the first town with a siding and pull off on the siding because there's a southbound train coming the other way. And you two don't want to meet on the track. So you wait until the southbound train goes, and then you go back on, and then you might hit a water tower stop to refill your tender with water because you don't want that locomotive blow off. And then you hit a wood pile next to the water tower. Throw more wood on the tender so you can keep fueling that big beast that's sucking up, I forget how many thousand, a hundred ton, uh, pounds of wood of an hour uh, to get up there. And then you finally, oh, then you get to Big Shanty and you have breakfast, and then Andrew's Raiders show up and steal your drink. Uh, which is exactly what happened. That was the breakfast stop. And then you would roll on up to Chattanooga and be up there about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I just drove it last week in uh, an hour and 50 minutes on I-75. So the, the, you do that because of um, the southbound trains or if you're going southbound the northbound trains. You don't want to collide. That scheduling is very regimented, and you had to stick to that unless you wanted collisions and losing rolling stock. And, and collisions. In the great locomotive chase, there, when you come into Dalton, Georgia, before they make, excuse me, Tunnel Hill, before you make the turn into the tunnel, there's a pretty radical turn, and the, the, the general hit that turn at over 50 miles an hour. And the Confederates were like, whoa, because they thought that thing was just gonna roll. And there was a slight bank on the turn, but it, it stayed on the track and just roared right, right on through the tunnel. And of course, Texas is coming right behind it. So, but, but that, I have not seen anything about the wagon train, local railroad, and my grandfather was in the Illinois Central Railroad, so yeah, timetable, 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 timetable. And the main problem is Georgia had six time zones back there. Just Georgia. <laughs> Sir? How critical was the telegraph and you and uh, flying to the- Thank you for bringing that up. Communication, this is, the, the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain is the first battle of the Civil War where the corps, where Sherman can talk to his corps commander, not by finding this nice man on a horse and me handing him a pencil written notes to take this to General McPherson uh, and tell him to bring his corps to this road and pivot and attack that part of Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, I'm sitting the telegrapher at Sherman's headquarters going, General McPherson, General Sherman's compliments, you will take your corps to this road, pivot to the right, and hit that side of Kennesaw Mountain by telegraph. They're laying telegraph lines on the battlefield. First battle of civil war that does it. So that's how, and then of course, Grant and Sherman are talking to each other every day. And you know what the number one thing they're talking about? Make sure Lee doesn't send anybody to Georgia, think James Longstreet, the previous year, and make sure Joe Johnson doesn't send anybody to Virginia. So the sooner you get to that Augusta Railroad, General Sherman, the happier I, U.S. Grant, are going to be. Because that's the direct line to Virginia. <laughs> so they're talking, they're talking to Lincoln, uh, Stanton, you name it, Porter, uh, uh, Henry Halleck, uh, all these quartermaster officers, all by telegram. So yeah, those wires are buzzing. Great book that came out a few years ago. Get it if you haven't. Called Abraham Lincoln's or Lincoln's T mails. Telegraphing and emails are the exact same thing. One goes with the keyboard, one goes with the Morse code key. Same thing, same concept. Goes over a wire. And Lincoln would, was into technology, and he, he was an insomnia, Actually, he would walk out of the White House. Imagine that, no detail. Walk down to the War Department, walk into the telegraph room, and here's some corporal in there banging the key, and he turns around and here's the President of the United States looking over his shoulder. Can I see that, Sonny? Yes, sir, Mr. President. Whatever. So Lincoln kept his finger on the pulse of what was going on. So he could see this stuff. He was very connected with his commander, especially by 64 when he knows he's got Rand over here, he's got Sherman over here. Oh, thank God I don't have to deal with Clone anymore. <laughs> sir. How did some of the time schedules? Like you know, Eastern Standard and, and, and Central Standard, they, they didn't have that work out then, did they? That's what that's way after the war. What the modern time zones yeah, are. Yeah. yeah, there was an article in Bloomberg magazine I read it years ago, and the guy talked about the six time zones in Georgia. And I forget how he said he reconciled everything, but people could figure it out. And then I'm sure at some point people like, this is stupid. I mean, yeah, Georgia's the biggest thing is missing the river, but six time zones in one state, that's really and then at some point, and, and so from what I understand, the railroads drive the time zones we have now. Is that correct? Is there a railroad guy? I heard a guess over here. 
I, I think that was the, that's what my grandfather told me anyway. Of course, he recorded and grandfather never lied. Might make stuff up. He's never lied. Anybody? Gentlemen, thank you guys for coming. We had a good time. Please come back. Thank you for bringing your boys here. There's our next generation members right there. Anybody else? Did you have a question? Okay. Good. All right. Budget doing a submission. Thank you very much.